Okay. Good morning, everyone. This is Chuck at Midori Farm, and welcome to our community farm event number five. Um, today we're at the sweet potato field that we started five months ago. And uh, as you can see, our sweet potato farm is actually quite full of sweet potato vines. And we're very happy about that. It's a good sign that we're gonna get a lot of great sweet potato tubers this year. And we're excited to harvest those out probably next month. So if you're in the area and you'd like to join us, please make sure you contact me either through my website, midorifarm.net, uh, Facebook, which is also Midori Farm, or through uh, some other channels. And uh, let me know that you wanna come out and help us harvest sweet potatoes and even take one or two home with you when you, when you go. Um, but for now, we're just gonna talk about what's going on with the sweet potatoes right now and uh, what's in store for us. So as you can see, we have a, the whole sweet potato farm kind of quarantined with this, with this green netting here, okay? And you might be thinking, geez, why did they put all this green netting over here? And I gotta tell you, it's because of monkeys. Monkeys oh. have for several years come onto my farm and taken my sweet potatoes. And it's a really, really big problem for me. Um, I must say that having monkeys on my farm has been one of the most challenging things I've ever faced in farming. Uh, monkeys love sweet potatoes. So what we've done this year is we've covered them with this net and so far it's proven very effective. So I recommend for those of you who are also in Japan or countries like India or other countries uh, which have uh, problems with monkeys coming on their farms, try covering your fields with this kind of netting and you might have more success in keeping them away. Because of course, we want to eat our sweet potatoes. We're not growing them for the local wildlife as much as we support nature, of course. Um, so the sweet potato vines are actually pushing against here. You can see they, they want to spread out even further and further. And in some places, they're actually poking out like this. And when they do that, the deer will come along and trim them off. And what we've just started doing at Midori Farm for our uh, veggie box customers is uh, our customers who get a box of vegetables are now getting some sweet potato leaves as well. Why? What do people do with sweet potato leaves? It's not the tuber. Can you eat sweet potato leaves? The answer is yes. Sweet potato leaves are very nutritious and very delicious. And it's a very popular uh, food for, uh, in, in places like India and Thailand and uh, South America where sweet potatoes originally come from. So if you're curious about sweet potato leaves, you can look online for recipes. And if you'd like to get some, please order a basket with Midori Farm or your nearest local sweet potato farmer. And please make sure it's organic. Okay, um, are there any questions so far? I hear that we have at least one participant. Would you like to ask a question? No? Are you type, maybe you're typing a comment. <laughs> okay. Can I have the name of the participant? Hmm? Tipitania. Tipitania. Okay, Tipitania. I look forward to your comment or your question. Uh, I never know that sweet potato leaves are edible, why, but why don't they sell it? Ah, oh, this is a good question. Thank you for the good question. I have never seen sweet potato leaves in the supermarket myself or for sale anywhere. But I imagine if you went to places like South America or India or some other places, you might actually see them in the markets because it is a popular food there. I think basically sweet potatoes are so easy to grow that a lot of farmers don't take the time to really manage them very well. And the leaves can get eaten by insects or uh, just get too big or too uh, unmanageable. And uh, there's so many other different varieties of leaves that we can eat that uh, people just dismiss them. But I love educating people about food and what's possible, especially for organic food. So I encourage you to go out there and search for sweet potato leaves if you can find them. Otherwise, you can uh, maybe contact a local farmer and see what they've got. Thanks for the great question. I see, I hope I can try them someday. Thanks for the answer. 
Oh, my pleasure, Titania. Thank you for asking. Okay, well, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna shift gears a little bit and I'm gonna invite my son, Junior, who's helped me every step of the way with the sweet potato farm to come on in here and have a conversation with me. So, come on, Junior. So, tell me a little bit about yourself, Junior. Uh, where do you live? I live in Kyoto. Oh, okay, how old are you? I'm nine years old. Okay, when's your birthday? December 11th. Oh, you're almost 10. All right, very good. And uh, do you like coming out here to Midori Farm? Yes, because I can see a lot of creatures and I can go hiking and swim in the river, so. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, what are your favorite creatures up here? Snakes. <laughs> Have you ever seen a mamushi, a poisonous snake? No. I think we saw a little baby one two years ago. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but it was so small. But do you want to see a mamushi? Yes. Okay. You're pretty strong. Most people are pretty scared of those, though. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Well, uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about sweet potatoes. Now, mm -hmm. you've helped me this year to grow them out, but it was your first time. So I'm wondering, do you remember how we grow our sweet potatoes? Uh, first, we put uh, organic sweet potato into a pot with soil. Oh, like a whole potato, a whole sweet potato. Yeah. Okay, in, in, into the pot of soil, yeah. okay. And then we keep watering it. Mm-hmm, ah, of course, yeah. yeah. And then keep it safe, like, uh -huh. don't make like the creek other animals eat it or something. I've had monkeys eat mine before, yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, right out of the soil. <sighs> and we try to keep it safe. Uh-huh. Then after that, from the potato, slips grew. What are slips? Slips are like, uh, they're like leaves, mm -hmm. which come out. Oh, okay, like little baby plants. Yeah. Oh, okay. And so then slips come out of the baby, out of the sweet potato. Yeah. Oh, cool. And then. How long does that take? Mm, two, three, four months. Oh, that's that's a long time. I think it took about one and one or one or two months for us to get oh, yeah. full slips, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when they when the slips became full, we gently took them out, took them out of the potato. Okay, we removed them from the potato. And then we put it into a different jar with water in it. Okay. Just water. Just water. Okay. And then in about three, four months, weeks, maybe? weeks uh, the pot potato slips, uh, roots came out. Ah, roots come out the bottom of the sweet potato slip. I see. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then after that, uh, we put them in the soil. Mm -hmm. And then we kept watering them. And then like about five, six months. And weeks and then so many potatoes uh-huh so many sweet potato plants now right yeah do you remember how many sweet potato plants we put in the ground here about mm, 15. how many 15. 15 well i think there's 15 in each row and there's six rows so it's uh 90. Good math skills, <laughs> way to go. That's right, it was about 90 or 100 sweet potato plants. And yeah. some of them actually died. So yeah. we replaced those with some other ones. So yeah, it's right around 100, I would say. And did you remember how many different varieties of sweet potatoes we planted? Hmm, about four. Yeah, it was four or five different kinds of sweet potatoes. Um, do you know any of the names of the sweet potato varieties? No. No, yeah, there's Narutokin Toki, there's uh, Annoimo, and that's the good one, right? That one's yeah. kind of got orange flesh inside and it's really nice roasted. Now, what's your favorite way to eat a sweet potato? Uh, it's usually with Nikujaga. Nikujaga, okay. Yeah. What about Yakiimo? Do you like that? Ishi Yakiimo. I love it, yeah. Yeah, and I think mommy makes pretty good sweet potato soup, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. Okay, cool. So when it's time next month to harvest, what do you think we're going to do? Now, this is something you've, you've never done before. So this is a guess. So if you get it wrong, it's okay. So what do you think we're going to do when we want to harvest these things? What's step one? 
uh, make sure the monkeys are not near. Good, good point. That's always a good point. Or the monkeys are not looking. <laughs> That's right. That's right, because they're always watching. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we take the these green mm -hmm. uh, the nets. nets. And then we take them away. Yes. Yes, that's correct. We have to. Mm -hmm. And then we gently, gently take the good potatoes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. out of the soil. Mm -hmm. And then the small ones, like this one, mm -hmm. we should save. And then, like in like two weeks, we should come again and then see if it's big. And then we gently take them out. Very good. That's exactly right. But it's really hard to get to the sweet potatoes themselves. You know why? Because there's all these vines. Yeah. So how do we find out where the sweet potatoes are? We find the ground mm -hmm. and we, uh, we, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tough question. It's okay if you don't yeah. know. I know. <laughs> That's okay. Actually what we do, um, is we, we remove the vines first. So we cut all the vines away, except like you said, if there's ones that seem pretty small, we leave those vines and let them grow a few more weeks, yeah. let them get bigger, right? But for the big ones, we cut away all the vines first. And then we have almost an empty field with just the sweet potatoes in the ground, uh -huh. okay? What do you think we do next to gently remove them? What, how, do you, how do we do that? So we put our hands like this mm -hmm. on each side, yeah. And then we like get touch the sweet potato inside, mm -hmm. and then we curve it out, mm -hmm. and then we take it out. Yeah, you know how big is a sweet potato? The biggest I've seen is like about this size. Mm -hmm. It's pretty big, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And is that how long it is or how round it is? How long? Okay. How how fat do you think they get? About this fat? Yeah, that's a big sweet potato. But there's actually a picture on our website or our Facebook page, I can't remember which, maybe both, of you when you were about four years old. Ah, uh, yeah. How big was that sweet potato? About the same. That's right. It was as big as your head. Yeah. <laughs> you could have my head. That's right. You know why? Because I like to leave my sweet potatoes in the ground for a very long time. I think most sweet potato farmers leave their sweet potatoes in the ground after the slips are nice and big and they plant them out maybe two to four months. And that's, it's a big range because I think some, some people want to grow them only till they're pretty small and that's fine. And they harvest them and that's how they sell them. And you? some maybe medium size. Oh, how about me? Good. Good question. I like to leave them in the ground the maximum amount of time. And I do that because I'm not wanting, I don't want to use this farm for anything else this year. I'm not in a hurry to get them out and get the next crop in. And that's something most farmers are doing, especially farmers who are farming them for profit, you know, and, and for a business like I'm doing. So I'm unusual in that I like to leave them in the ground until they're huge. They're absolutely massive. Uh, most people say my sweet potatoes are bigger than any they've ever seen. And that's not always a good thing because cutting up a sweet potato is pretty tough. So not everybody wants the huge ones, but I like them that size and uh, they taste great. And I get the maximum yield, which means the most amount of sweet potatoes that I can. But a lot of farmers want to say, okay, it's been three months. Let's take them out because we got to put in our next, next year's onions or the daikons or the cabbages or whatever else they want to plant next. Now, one thing farmers probably already know uh, is that sweet potatoes are called root vegetables. They're in the root vegetable category. And after a root vegetable, you probably don't want to plant another root vegetable. Um, you want to plant something else. And the nice mnemonic that I like to think of is roots, greens, fruits, beans. So that means after a root vegetable like sweet potatoes, we want to plant something leafy green like cabbage or uh, maybe lettuce or Hoxide. Chinese cabbage, hawkside that's Chinese cabbage, kale, chard. I'm gonna stop, I think we have a question. Yes? Do the sweet potatoes taste the same after they're so big? Oh, good question. Are the sweet potato, do the sweet potatoes taste the same after they're so big? And the answer is, yes, they do. That's a very good question. Uh, they're much like potatoes and then it doesn't really matter the size of them. 
as long as they're ripe. And sweet potatoes become ripe pretty soon. So uh, you can actually harvest them almost at any size. I hope that answers your question. But the only thing again with the big ones is they're a bit harder to cut up. <laughs> okay, really I, they are good, aren't they? Yeah. They're bitter than, so the ones you keep about three weeks is easy to cut, but not so yummy. Oh. And six weeks, like yours, is hard to cut up, but it's really good. And it's like so yellow. Yeah, that's right. And I think that um, the big ones that get really big, they're harder to roast. And Japan loves roasted sweet potatoes. And actually, I do too. They roast them whole in the skin, and it's super great. Um, it's almost impossible to do that with the big fat ones because there's just so much volume in there. They don't roast as well. So we, what we do is we take our giant ones and we separate them out from the smaller ones because we always get some of both sizes. And then the smaller ones are for roasting and the larger ones are for soups and curries and things like that. Good job. Okay, I think we have another question. Are they sweeter? I don't believe so, no. I think they're basically the same taste. They're just a bigger size. Holding for another comment, question? No, we're good? Okay, very good. So, Junior, uh, what do you think uh, is the best thing about farming? Uh, you get to uh, know wildlife. Ah, you know how many insects I see every day? Million. <laughs> Maybe not a million, but certainly more than uh, 10 or 20. I mean, I see all different kinds of insects. And what insect do farmers like? Uh, so when it's hot, uh, dragonflies, because when we're hot and we're in the sun and we're cutting the sweet potatoes and stuff, we get a lot of, we sweat a lot. And then the mosquitoes come to the sweat, but the dragonflies eat the mosquitoes. And in any case, uh, uh, ladybugs. Ladybugs, why do we like ladybugs? Do you remember? That's right, you're right. We love ladybugs, do you know why? Because they eat the bugs which try to eat our potatoes and carrots and all the vegetables. That's right. Those little bugs are called aphids or aburamushi in Japanese. And they are terrible. They like to eat the leaves of plants. And when they start eating the leaves of the plants, the plants die. And these ladybugs, boy, they eat a lot of those aphids. That's right. There's one more important insect that I think you remember. It's the one that likes to go from flower to flower. Bees. That's right. Now, most people, do you like bees? I like them. I don't like wasps and suzumibachi. That's right. Suzumibachi, the, the murder hornets or giant Japanese hornets. Yeah, those are no fun. But bees are a farmer's great friend because they will pollinate. And pollination is important for any plant that has a flower and that flower needs to be pollinated before the fruit grows. So any fruiting plants. Do, what, what do you think is a fruiting plant? Can you give me an example of a fruiting plant? Uh... Strawberries? Strawberries are definitely a fruiting plant. Very, very good. They love bees. But actually, strawberries don't really need, don't really need pollinators. But do you know tomatoes are also a fruit? Yeah. Watermelons? Yeah. Yep. What's the long green one that we eat in salads? Uh, cucumbers. That's right. Cucumbers are fruits as well. Also melons. But also there are other fruiting plants like eggplants Apple. and peppers. Apples. Very good. Anything that's a fruit, but a lot of vegetables are also called fruiting plants, okay? All those category of plants need, mostly need pollinators because something has to carry the pollen from one flower to another. Sometimes it's just a regular flower. Sometimes there's a male flower and a female flower like cucumbers and all cucurbits like squashes and zucchinis. They have a male flower and a female flower. And without those pollinators, we're in trouble because guess what? those fruits don't grow. So that's pretty sad. So we love the bees. We say, we hope the bees are safe and happy and we hope to support other people who are helping save the bees. So bees are good. What insect doesn't pop like? 
Cucumber beetles. <laughs> Cucumber beetles are my number one enemy, that's for sure. But what are, that's right. What'd you say? Butterflies. But everybody loves butterflies. Why would I hate butterflies? Because they lay their eggs on cabbage and we like to eat cabbage. What do the eggs do? The eggs hatch and the small, the baby butterfly comes out. What's that called? Uh, the very hungry. A caterpillar. <laughs> and then the caterpillar eats the cabbage and we have no cabbage to eat. So. That's right. And many times when we cut up the cabbage to eat it, there's caterpillars inside. Yeah. Are they yummy? So that's right. So most farmers love bees, don't love caterpillars and butterflies. Sorry, they're not our friend. But you know, we love all and, and try to preserve all wildlife. So as an organic farmer, I'm here to say that not only am I trying to raise vegetables for people, but also trying to stay in harmony with nature and my environment and to support my community. So I think that's an important thing to take away. Um, that there are some things that we have trouble with, like monkeys and cucumber beetles and caterpillars and other things. But rather than spraying you know, hazardous poisons which will harm other things and trying to eliminate them, we try to find natural ways to solve our problems. And that's an ongoing struggle. And that's one of the reasons people might say, well, why are organic vegetables so much more expensive? That's one of the main reasons is it sometimes takes twice as much effort or more to grow those vegetables because we're not using these convenient chemicals and spraying them into our ecosystems and polluting other things. So please support local organic farmers, especially if they're small. Okay, Gina, that was great. Do you have anything else you wanna talk about? Uh, you s I said bees and bees pollinate, but I hear bats do too. Oh, I've never heard that. We have to look that up. I know you're, you're, you love animals, so let's look that up together. Yeah, but I hear only some bats do it. So if those bats do it, do you like them? What a good question. What a great question. Well, you know, I already like bats. I think bats are pretty cool because they're the only mammal that can fly. I mean, that's pretty cool. I mean, wow. And they have sonar, you know, echolocation. That's pretty awesome. It's like a superhero. And I mean, Batman is one of my favorite superheroes. You like Batman? Yeah. Yeah, he's pretty cool. So I think that, yeah, I love bats already. And because they pollinate, I love them even more. Yeah, me too. Okay, well, I think that's all we have for you, Junior. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah. And uh, yeah, let's get back to work later. Okay. okay, cool. All right. Well, that's all for Junior's time. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, please post them. Or uh, if you're looking at this on YouTube, because this will be on YouTube soon for those of you watching live now, or if you've missed it live and you're watching on YouTube, thanks for joining us on the Midori Farm uh, channel. And uh, please comment and like and subscribe if you can. We've got lots of videos for people uh, talking about different things about how to grow vegetables, how to manage them, different problems and interviews with volunteers and things like that. We love your support, so we hope to see you uh, come back and watch some more. Okay, well, we've got two special volunteers with us today. Uh, I didn't say this before, but Junia and I both live in Kyoto City, but originally I come from America. So I have some experience with uh, some farms and growing vegetables in America, but not very much at all. I really learned everything I, I know here in Japan. And I study through a variety of ways, through podcasts and websites, and just basically trial and error, lots of error. But uh, you know, I find that the more I talk to people from international countries and other places, the more I can learn about stuff because um, farming is something that people all over the world are doing. And there's so many things that we share in common, even though we're from di totally different countries with completely different climates and completely different vegetable uh, varieties and dietary habits and workforces and economies and cultures and everything. There's so much we have in common. So I find that the more internationally minded farmers are, the better the international farming community is and the stronger because we can all share our tips and tricks and uh, recipes and seeds
save tips and things like that, because that's what we're all about. We're all about creating the best food for the best people without creating a large impact on the environment. So right now I'd like to invite a young woman from China uh, named Tong, and she's gonna help us out uh, to talk a little bit about growing things in China. Tong, come on down here. Here, right? Yeah, that's yeah. fine. So, Tong, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Tell me uh, where you're from, what you're doing in Japan, and things like that. Okay, I come from China, and especially in the north part of China. Uh, I came to Japan because I'm doing my PhD, like PhD, yeah, and uh, that, that is all. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, PhD, that's yeah. pretty big. I mean, so you studied your, 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 your rest of your studies were in China. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And uh, oh, yeah, also my, my major is about meteorology and also about some, like some kind of skill about climate change. And yeah. And well, the reason that I came to Japan because Japan and China, like we are close to each other and some like the, Climate phenomena is kind of similar to each other because we are all, uh, always in the same like monsoon system, especially in the Asia region. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah. I think that these days, meteorologists in general have to study climate change. Yes, exactly. Because climate change, that I think the 10 years ago, it's become a world, a worldwide issue, a big issue. Every country, I think that they they have different uh, issues about the climate change and climate change like has every relationship with our lives and uh, not about the food the output of food about our life and also about other animals or creatures in the world so climate change is a big and huge issue in the world i mean as a farmer and i'm sure i'm speaking with speaking to a lot of farmers all across the world climate change has made things so much more difficult for us. I mean, planting schedules, you know, there used to be where you knew the first frost date of the year is gonna be about, let's say December 5th. And the last frost date might be around April 1st or something like that in your region. And it was region to region, but people knew these for centuries. Farmers would, would just know these things. So they knew when they could plant things out and when the deadline was for planting some things out. It's very important because farmers want to get the earliest possible crop to the market or to their customers and then hold out to the last possible minute at the same time to get the last crops out as well. But now it's like out the window because suddenly winters aren't winters anymore and typhoons are stronger and things like that. So it must make things much more difficult for meteorologists and climatologists. Of course, you know, because we used, uh, we make some simulations because every year, uh, the, uh, each region in the world, they have their self like uh, topography, they have different like local weather and uh, sometimes the machine or the computer is it's it's just uh, maybe uh, just a machine it's can't uh, finish this like work like our using our eyes to uh, detect uh, the weather it's very complicated and sometimes you may think that the weather cause a uh, weather forecast is not so accurate because it's really com complicated and we have to like uh, use many different things to put them together and to make the weather forecast. That is so difficult, especially for the farmers, for the agricultures, and for the plants, and for the forests, actually, yeah. Well, let me uh, take a step back uh -huh. from talking about climate change. Uh -huh. We'll come back to it. I just was curious. I mean, China is the most populated country in the world. It's arguably the oldest culture in the world. So I got to think that food in China is just so much variety and so much depth and so much difference region to region. Is yeah. that true? Yeah, yeah, it's true. So can you tell me something about farming in China that might be different from farming in Japan? Um, now, I just uh, know my hometown, actually. I'm not so sure other parts of China, but in my hometown, my hometown is uh, belong to the temperate climate. So the four seasons are very obvious to see. The spring is spring, the summer is summer, and uh, the, word, the amount of the rainfall is about 1,000 to 2,000 in a year. Millimeters? It's, yeah, millimeters. It's very good for the farm, especially like uh, the sweet potato with a plant 
the sweet potato in May and we can harvest it in October. So in this time span, we like we rain a lot and it's especially beneficial for the sweet potato, right? Mm -hmm. So especially in my hometown, we harvest a lot of like the amount of the output is a huge and the people in my hometown we love sweet potato and we will buy a lot of sweet potato just to put here put in our home and to like we can eat in winter mm -hmm. and the long time that we store in the home the sweet potato becomes sweeter and sometimes we don't eat rice actually but our soil is really good for rice but we would like to eat sweet potato instead of rice and the you know, sweet potato is full of nutrients. It's very healthy for our body. Yeah, so that is the situation in my hometown. Yeah, that's right. I think a lot of people don't realize that the sweet potatoes aren't just delicious, but they're one of the most nutritious things for humans. They found that it's one of the superfoods. And uh, I think we should just all eat more and more sweet potatoes. Yeah. And another thing you mentioned was really interesting is it's a great storage crop. Yes. I mean, the reason it's been around for so long before refrigerators is because you, you can store it for months and yes, months. And yes. it's, like you said, it gets yeah. sweeter and yes. sweeter. Yes, That's exactly. Right. Right. And people love sweet taste, right? Yeah. That's and right. it's not like rice. Sometimes we eat too much rice and become, uh, we become fat. But uh, sweet potatoes is full of the, the fiber and the other nutrition. It's very healthy for us. So yeah, why not, why not to choose a healthy food? Yeah. Now, Junie and I were talking a little bit about eating the leaves uh -huh. before. Um, do you eat the leaves in China? So maybe I never tried, but maybe some people they will like fry, or just fry like other vegetables. Just fry with the leaves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I never tried. Now, <clears throat> I have been to China, but uh -huh. just as a tourist, and I didn't visit any farms. <clears throat> I stayed mostly in uh, near Shanghai uh -huh. and Nanking. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, I have had some Chinese people visit my farm on a tour. Mm -hmm. I do farm tours through Airbnb experiences. So if you're ever in the area, please come on out and uh, join a tour. Um, but some of them were very interested, not only in the plants that I was growing, but the wild plants growing around my farm. Because they said, oh my gosh, you can eat this, you can eat this. Yeah, and I yeah, had yeah. no idea. And I think, like I said before, the Chinese culture and the history is so long and rich and deep that people have really figured out if it's edible or not, and they take advantage of those things. Yes, yeah, so it's the reason that we don't know why, like why they can be eaten. Because maybe in now we are in the like we are in a society of a fast speed, so most of the time the younger adults or the middle-aged people they don't cook so often. They just uh, eat in the restaurant, so they actually they don't have enough knowledge about the food or the plants or vegetables. And, uh, you know, in maybe my grandmother or my, my grandparents, they are old, so they know well about the plants. They know how to make use of the food, especially this is very healthy food. And uh, so like in my hometown, we would like to like uh, to go to the mountain to like uh, to get some wild vegetables mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and uh, it's very like precious because we can just uh, get them in special months like uh, may or july or Ju uh, june just like in this month and uh, it's very like in now it's very expensive actually because we don't plant this like wild vegetables and also but there is a very interesting point in my hometown that a uh, lot of people they have small garden mm -hmm. and they would like to plant in their home in their garden to plant vegetables and they can eat it's very healthy because you know sometimes we buy these vegetables they're full of uh, chemical things mm -hmm. and these chemical things can accu accumulate in our body it's not so good and they can plant to kill their time actually and also get a healthy food so mm -hmm. it's very interesting and my neighbors <clears throat> in my hometown a lot of like uh, my modern age people they they grow like they plant yeah in their home yeah. even people yeah. younger people younger people maybe no younger people may just eat their mother and fathers yeah they plant <clears throat> actually 
yeah. this is something that's very interesting to me internationally, as well as in Japan, is how popular is agriculture and farming and gardening with the younger generation? I'm almost 50. So I'm certainly no longer the younger generation, but people who are just graduating university, you know, the 20s, early 30s, are they interested in farming? Are they interested in organic food, stuff like that in China? I think they are not interested about farming, but organic food, maybe they are interested because it's healthy. The thing, the reason is that maybe because they think it's a hard work, it's very like you need to spend a lot of time on this planting and take care of the plant. So they don't want to do the hard work. It's very tough. That's the reason. And they, they just want to enjoy the food. So the, that's the question that about organic food. And yes, now in China, more and more people are interested about organic food and they want to, they would like to buy organic food, even though the price is higher than the normal vegetables, but they would like to. Yeah. That's good news because I think what, that's the first step to really supporting the environment and your body yeah. is by buying organic vegetables yeah. because organic vegetables are grown with care not only to the vegetable but to the environment and society all organic farmers think about those things so when you're buying organic you're supporting those things it's worth the extra cost you're basically getting yourself food that's delicious and healthy healthier for you while donating some money to a, an important cause at the same yeah, time. Yeah, I think it's a beneficial circle because more and more people buy organic food. So we need more and more organic food. And a lot of people, maybe more and more people, they will like get started being a farmers to plant organic food. And that is so good to the, our nature and the environment. So maybe that's a good way or good solution to make our nature better. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a beneficial circle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, I mean, Tong, I met you because you asked to come and volunteer yeah. at Midori Farm. Yeah. I mean, this is another way that a lot of people, especially younger people, have come into my circles is to come volunteer for me at Midori Farm. I have a, an account on WorkAway, um, which is a volunteer organization, an international volunteer organization that connects willing volunteers with hosts across the world. And you can go out and stay with people in Ecuador or Guatemala or Paris or Rome or, or Greece or, or Africa or China or Japan or Australia. And you can help out on a farm uh, and you can uh, learn about farming. You can support the endeavors and you can stay at someone's house for free. You can also get free meals along with all the information while living in a foreign country being immersed in the culture and part of an environmental effort. I mean, it's really a great thing to yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, it's really a great thing. The reason that why, like, I can talk to you uh, uh, doing a volunteer because I want to know, I'm learning meteorology and I, I don't want to just learn this knowledge on the paper, on the book. I want to touch nature. I want to know how climate change, how the weather, like, have played an effect on our daily life on our food. So that's the reason that I want to do the things, even though it's sometimes it's really hard. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's really hard, but it's worthy. It's very worthy to know a lot of knowledge that you can't learn from the book. You can experience it and you get the real knowledge by myself. Yeah, yeah. So buy organic, volunteer on an organic farm, start your own garden, even if it's just in a container on your balcony. These are things that are connect, gonna connect you to your food. They're gonna open doors for you that allow you to see the simplicity and importance of food, how it's grown, and what we can do to help reverse climate change because I think that's really so important. Yeah, it's very important. And also it's uh, like, uh, it's very complicated. So when we talk about climate change or meteorology, it's a huge problem because we can't just select like throughout a big problem and we try different ways to solve it because so as a meteorology students we kind of like divided this problem into different departments of the problem like we divide it into mountain meteorology and ocean meteorology so for like the farm a middle farm it's located near the river and the mountain. So the mountain meteorology is very uh, important for the farm and the work in the farm. 
because it's like the in the local place because it's a small place it's very local and the local weather is difficult to like to make a weather forecast because we don't have enough data and we don't have enough like observation station to collect the data to make the accurate uh, like weather forecast so um like you basically every every day you have to be here maybe so for you you have to like collect data by yourself and uh, tell how weather will be tomorrow maybe tomorrow after the day before after tomorrow yeah after tomorrow yeah so i think when we talk about uh, meteorology or modern meteorology we have to know some basic information and basic common knowledge to like protect ourselves especially when you know in uh, japan this year we suffered a huge heavy rainfall how to protect yourself how to protect your food how to protect your farm is very important so knowing this knowledge by experiencing is yeah it's very important yeah i agree completely i really do now i'm going to ask a few more questions and if anybody has a comment or a question for tong about climate change or uh meteorology please type it in while we're talking and we'll get it on we'll get it talked about um, the one thing that I wanted to know is how have the typhoons that that strike Japan and China how have they been affected by climate change? So uh, just um, give an example of this year. So this year the sea surface temperature is higher than the normal value two degrees. So the the, the 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 surface water of the ocean is two degrees warmer. Yes, yes, exactly. Or well, maybe. But uh, I know that uh, the warm, the temperature of the sea surface is the very important factor to give birth of a typhoon. So if the temperature is higher than 26 degree, it's very easy to like produce typhoon. Oh. That's why this year we have three typhoon, like Haishin, Musak, and uh, Bavi. Uh, in like in 10 days or in two weeks, we have we have three typhoons and. Uh, Go uh, went through Japan and my hometown. It's very rare situation. It's never happened, especially in my hometown. We never happened that this way. You've never had a typhoon. We have typhoon, but we never have like a one and two and three. Oh. It's continue, it's continue way to have this kind of typhoon. Yeah. So the sea temperature is very important, and that's the reason this year we have three typhoon. And uh, yeah, like you should they su su yeah, suffer it a lot. Mm -hmm, yes, mm -hmm, exactly. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, for an organic farmer, especially, or any farmer, your, your crops are growing in the climate. So if there's climate change, if there's typhoons, if there's droughts, if there's floods, we're affected more than any other industry because we're not inside in an air conditioned office or, or a heated, office or or with concrete walls and we can't close the windows you know we can't we're outside you know so when climate change comes a knocking with a typhoon or drought or something like that we suffer greatly so i think most organic farmers internationally can can relate to this that we're extremely interested in trying to figure out how to stop climate change, how to reverse it, how to get back on track, because it'll make everything better for us, which makes everything better for the environment and for society and for every individual out there. Yeah, I totally agree. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Tong. I really appreciate not only you coming out and helping so much on Midori Farm, but for your time today in our interview. And uh, yeah, thanks thank you again. So much. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, Let's see, we've got uh, about 15 minutes left, I guess. And uh, we've got uh, one more special volunteer to talk to. Um, Tong, as I said, was from China. I'm from America. We've got one more uh, great volunteer from Australia to join us now. And we're gonna ask her to come out and talk with us a little bit more. I think I'm gonna stand up for it. So you might wanna move the camera. I'm not as Japanese as I should be. My knees aren't so good at, uh, you know, being flexible and sitting on the ground so much. I'm getting better, I'm getting better. That was about 15 or 20 minutes. That's pretty good for me. <laughs> okay. I'd like to introduce you to Hana from Australia. Hana, would you please introduce yourself? Tell us uh, where you're from and what you're doing in Japan. 
Uh, yes, my name's Hannah. I'm from Queensland in Australia, which is the northeast. northeast. Yeah, northeast. Um, I've been living in Japan for about a year, been teaching English in Mie and Aichi Prefecture. And now I am a workaway here on Midori Farm. So I found Chuck through Workaway, which you mentioned earlier. And yeah, I've been living here for about two and a half weeks. Yeah, that's two correct. weeks. Yeah, two, yeah, two and a half weeks. Yep. And so I'm about halfway through. I have another couple of weeks here. Yes. And we're going to miss you when you go. You've been awesome. Oh, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed being here. It's been a wonderful experience and feels good to have a tangible, I guess, outcome. Um, after studying for so many years and then being a teacher, it's really good to get my hands dirty and yeah, get back to the roots. One thing I'd like to mention about uh, work away and volunteering and things like that is my farm in particular depends on volunteers. Without volunteers, we would not be nearly as successful as we are because I can only be a part-time farmer. I can only come to the farm three days a week. Um, which is much less than I'd like to. I'd love to live up here and be here forever, but that's for some time in the future. But for now, it's just three days a week, which isn't enough for doing all the watering, the weeding, and the daily maintenance, and keeping the monkeys away, and the harvesting, and everything else. So I really rely on volunteers. I love my volunteers. They're a very, very important part of Midori Farm, and I really appreciate them. But because of the latest pandemic of COVID, of course, travel restrictions have made it impossible for many of the volunteers to get here. And so I've been stuck without volunteers that I had scheduled through the end of October, had to all cancel on me. And I was more than a month without anyone up here, which was really a struggle. And I put out the feelers for people on Facebook and for everybody watching or listening right now, if you're in the Kansai area of Japan and you'd like to come out and volunteer, I'd so love to have you because I need all the help I can get. And the only fortunate outcome so far for COVID has been it kept Hana here in Japan longer than she was planning on staying. And so she's like, what am I going to do with my time? I'll volunteer. Thank you so much for choosing. No, no problem. It's uh, not a bad country to be stuck in. I'm pretty fortunate and very fortunate to be able to spend the time out here in the Dory Farm. Yeah. Now, you mentioned to me before you're going to go study horticulture back in Australia. Yes, yeah, so I will go on to do my master's and it will be uh, horticulture and sustainable agriculture, but also environmental management. So, of course, Australia has dealt with some um, pretty severe natural disasters and growing up, uh, in Queensland, we were always in drought, which of course has a huge effect on our agricultural community. So I'm looking forward to taking some of the things I've learned here and yeah, furthering that education. Um, sorry, do we have any questions or comments? Uh, so like, Tanya said, I will. I'm in Tokyo now, but planning to go there in November. All right. I'd love to have you. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> Happy to have you. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, if I can quickly say, so Tanya wrote a comment earlier mm -hmm. uh, that in her hometown, Thailand, there has been a lot more interest in um, sustainable agriculture and home planting due to coronavirus, which I think a lot of people have had to come to the realization that the infrastructure we have around our food sources aren't as dependable as we had hoped and yeah starting to be more sustainable and self-sufficient which is wonderful outcome yeah i listen to some radio shows and podcasts about agriculture and i've heard that same thing in america too it's mainly people are stuck at home what are you going to do and a lot of people in the states have a front yard a backyard a place to garden or even a few balcony space and they've been growing their own food much more this year than before. One of my favorite uh, radio shows is called You Bet Your Garden and with host Mike McGrath, who I absolutely love. He's hilarious and he's brilliant. And he, uh, he's been really a big help and influence on me. And he talks about it a lot and he says, well, you know, if you wanna go out and go buy garlic, for example, to grow out, you can't, it's all sold out. If you wanna get some transplants for cabbages, you better go now because they're going to sell out. So I think it's like a worldwide movement 
people are stuck home, they have nothing else to do, and they start to think, well, I can't grow my own toilet paper. I'm now quoting Mike, by the way. Uh, you can't grow your own toilet paper, but you can grow your own food. So if things really hit the fan, at least we've got something to eat. Yes, I know all our home uh, department stores in Australia, my friends have reported, there are no seedlings left. There are no plants left. There's no compost left. Everyone's really stepping in and stepping up to use uh, their space as much as possible. As awful as COVID is, and I, I, I don't try to bring any light to it, there's a great positive in the fact that people are getting more in touch with their food, how to grow it themselves. Mm -hmm. Because I gotta tell you, it's changed my life. It's been about 12 years since I threw some seeds in the ground here. And now it is a passion. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's more than a job. It's, it's a calling, really. It's a vocation for me to be here. And I feel now with climate change and everything else going on, I can't give it up. And I think other people are going to feel the same sort of connection to farming, to hard work, to the environment, to weather, and to great homegrown food. I think that's so important. Now, I was curious. Um, do, I mean, I, I know Australia has... It's, it's huge, first of all. I think most people don't realize how just enormous it is. It's about the same land mass as the U.S., maybe even bigger? Ah, uh, yeah, roughly the same. Maybe a little bigger. Maybe a bit of yeah. Canada thrown in. <laughs> yes, a little bit of Canada included in that. But yeah, it's huge and it's very uh, arid land. But um, I think a lot of people forget there's a lot of diversity in the climate and in the land there. And one of um, your other volunteers on... Wednesday actually mentioned when he thinks of Australia, he doesn't think of any greenery, which is funny because my state is very lush in areas and yeah, there's a lot of rainforest. So yeah, but it's a huge country with a small population. <laughs> is there a question? Sorry. Okay, just let me know when there's a question. Sorry, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, yeah, I've been to Australia twice. Loved it, loved it, loved it. But I spent most of my time underwater diving because the Great Barrier Reef is just uh, uh, amazing. But that's one of the first things that I've noticed was hit by climate change. Yeah, coral bleaching is a huge issue um, as the sea temperatures rise and with water pollution as well, of course. But mainly the rise in sea temperatures, uh, coral bleaching has happened to so much of the reef. Um, I've heard also runoff has been a big problem. Yeah, runoff's huge. And from one of Australia's main exports is coal and the coal industry and the mining industry in Australia is very big, unfortunately. And runoff even from the mining industry has a huge impact. Um, without getting too specific, Adani Mine has just been given the go ahead in my state to open uh, a very one of the largest mines in Australia. And that'll have a devastating impact on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, which is a natural wonder of the world. Mm -hmm. And it's right off Queensland, right? Yeah, right off Queensland, northern Queensland. Um, yeah, it's, there's so many projects going to try and rehabilitate the reef, um, which is wonderful. It's wonderful what they're doing there. But at the end of the day, we should be proactive, not reactive. So... Yeah, it's, I, I mean, it's putting a Band-Aid on a, on a wound yeah. rather than preventing the wound. I mean, come on, let's stop. Let's stop killing the environment rather than trying to save it. Let's just stop killing it. Agreed. <laughs> well, I'm curious. Uh, you said Queensland is pretty lush. Um, yes. So we're talking about sweet potatoes. Do you grow sweet potatoes there? Yeah, Queensland is actually the largest producer of sweet potatoes in Australia. Australia produces around 100,000 tons of sweet potatoes annually. Uh, most of that, I think it's 80% comes from Queensland. Um, we grow four different varieties. I have their names. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to keep those yeah. in mind. I couldn't remember the ones that I planted. Let's have a look. <laughs> we have, um, so Bundaberg in Northern Queensland is the major. Isn't that the name of a rum? It is Bundaberg <laughs> rum. Oh, you know Australians uh, well. It's not good. Don't drink it, but it, I know it. But yeah, sweet potatoes and sugarcane are the two major agricultural industries in that region. Oh, um, is are the sweet potatoes used to make alcohol by any chance? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Because I know sugarcane is used to make rum. I wonder yeah. if they can make from sweet potatoes. Possibly. I've never given it much thought. That would be good to look into. Uh, of course, Australians love their alcohol, so I'm sure anything that could be used <laughs> to make a beverage has been used. They use it in Japan, actually. I drink a drink called shochu, which is like a, 
which is like a, it's like a 20, 25% alcohol. So it's not 20, 25 proof alcohol. So it's not very strong. It's somewhere between wine and whiskey. And um, they make it from all different kinds of things. And my favorite of it is made from sweet potatoes. So I know it's possible. So it'd be an interesting thing. I think we have a question. Yeah. What do you think? What is the easiest way to influence people who have no idea what's really going on to adapt their lifestyle to be more sustainable and helpful? Mm -hmm. Maybe give them the largest sweet potato? <laughs> That's not a bad idea. I'm going to give my answer, then I'll let Hannah give hers. Mine particularly is come out to the farm, come out and spend a day with us, see how food is grown, touch the soil, plant something, weed something, water something, harvest something, trellis something, protect something, realize where your food is coming from and what, how it's important that we preserve that because again, organic farmers are trying their best to be in harmony with nature. So you will see a very diverse wildlife much like my son Junior was speaking about earlier, is he loves coming here to see all the insects and the birds and the frogs and the snakes. That is the circle of life that surrounds and, and is part of my farm. And that is what I'm trying to preserve because those sort of ecosystems with a lot of diversity are quite strong. And when climate change or some other natural disaster comes along, that ecosystem can rebound faster because it has so much diversity. It's when farmers monocrop and they sterilize the soil with chemicals and they use all these greenhouses and plastics. That's when the, 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 the natural environment surrounding it is destroyed. The river systems, the groundwater, the trees, the wildlife, the birds are gone. And when you know typhoons go through those places, it's just a wasteland. So I'd say for my answer, come on out to a farm, experience it for a day, try to change your life about what you eat and how you feel about organic agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, great question. Oh, another question? Oh. No? Okay, <laughs> great question. Um, yes, I think for people who are already slightly sustainably minded or interested, that's the first step. So many people are just completely unaware. So if you're already interested and you want to find out how to make a difference, wonderful, first step in the right direction. And yeah, if you have the time, absolutely, to go out to an organic farm, the dory farm, and experience it and see the work that goes in. I know I am so much more appreciative now of where my food comes from and the effort that has gone into producing it. And uh, secondly, I'd like to say, put your money where your belief is. Unfortunately, <laughs> sustainability will only continue to grow if it's seen to be commercially viable. So if more and more consumers are choosing to take the sustainable option, the organic option, that industry will continue to grow and more people will get involved. Um, in Australia, unfortunately, organic and sustainability um, is it's very popular but it's very closely related with like privilege and those who are privileged enough and have the financial kind of flexibility can uh, partake in that lifestyle but that's changing mm -hmm. and the more people who jump on board the more success it's going to have and the more widespread it can become because um, yeah, it's a change that needs to happen. I think that's a great answer. I think one more thing is <clears throat> I live in Kyoto City. I farm in the wild of Japan. So I kind of get the best of both worlds. And what I see happen a lot more for urban dwellers, mm -hmm. especially, is there's so many other initiatives out there that aren't necessarily connected to organic agriculture, zero waste, no, less plastic, uh, reusable things, upcycling, uh, urban cleanup, things like that. I think that if you're really interested in something that has to do with uh, helping the environment, just look online and you'll find some other initiatives out there that are going to give you the opportunity to join in. And yeah, it doesn't have to be an expensive option. Just be thrifty. Like what happens to reuse, reduce, recycle? Like use things yeah. over. Reuse your string. Reuse your jars. You'll save money that way. And um, personally, not eating meat as well that's such a cheaper option and when I was a undergrad uni student I had no money but I could still afford to feed myself well and be healthy and choose those organic options because I was also choosing not to spend $30 on a steak every week so yeah I know um and I got I gotta just 
personally relate this because I have also gone off meat uh, for a couple of years and it's not, it wasn't actually for political or environmental reasons. It was, it was a gastrointestinal choice and I'm so glad I made it. And after that, I've, I've kind of seen where my Venn diagram is overlapping with these other issues and I find like, wow, I'm so glad I'm off it. But one of the statistics that I, two of the statistics I'd like to relate is, um, first of all, they say that of the mammals populating the earth, Humans are about 36%. Wild animals, wild mammals are 4%. 60% are cows and pigs and goats and sheep and, and uh, animals that humans have as livestock. That's unacceptable. That is totally unacceptable. And the second thing is that cattle, the beef industry, uh, whether it's for dairy or for meat or for leather, the, 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 the cattle industry has created more problems for climate change than the automobile industry. So with those two things, I hope people can visit your shops and make smarter, better choices to help our, our environment better. So I've heard the 12 o'clock bell while we were talking. So we're about to wrap it up. Is there anything else you wanted to say? Before you do, if you have any questions for Hannah, please post them or comments and we'll, we'll talk about them before we sign off. But first of all. Yeah, no, just thank you so much for joining. And I hope you do definitely get an opportunity to come out here. I've really enjoyed my time so far. And yeah, it's offered such a good perspective. And I was very interested to learn about um, organic farming in Japan specifically. Uh, this country uses a lot more plastic than I'm used to. So it's wonderful to see that there is a movement, especially in Kyoto Prefecture, I've noticed, towards sustainability and agriculture. And yeah, I hope spread the word a little bit more. Awesome. So, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Thank you, Hannah. Okay. Well, without any further ado, I think we're about ready to go. Any comments or questions before we leave? Fantastic. Okay. Well, I want to say thank you again to my son, Junior, who's helped out so much on the farm and uh, always a big supporter of me and coming out here. Thank you so much, buddy. And Tong, I'd like to say thank you to you as well. You're always uh, such a great supporter of us. And I, I'm so happy that you continue to come out. You're always welcome. Just let me know. And for those of you who don't know, Tong lives in Kyoto City. And what, what I do is I live there as well. I pick her up in Kyoto City. I drive her out to the farm. We work all day. Then I take her back to Kyoto City. So that's a very viable option for anybody wishing to come out to Midori Farm Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. And Hana as well, one of our long-term volunteers, a great, great hookup for me because I have somebody here to water and weed and do other jobs when I'm not here. It makes things go so much better and so much faster. And I want to thank everybody who's watching, either live or on YouTube. Thank you so much. Again, if you can, please like and comment or subscribe. That would really help me out to reach a further audience and to help the movement of sustainability and organic agriculture. Until then, my name is Chuck from Midori Farm. Thank you for joining us. See you another day.